All right, today our series that we're in right now is called Questions That People Ask. <clears throat> and the deeper I got into the series, putting stuff together, I really, the more I realized how many questions there are that people have asked me through the years. And to be honest, we're going to break this into a couple different series. Um, for today, we're going to look at how you and I can be sure of our faith, because through the years, that's one of the questions that people have asked me over and over again. How can I be sure that I really know Him? How can I be sure I, that Heaven's going to be my home? How can I be sure of those kind of things? So we're going to pray and get into it. Let's pray. God, thank You so much for this time with You. Lord, I ask that You would move in each one of our lives, and that on this day, that as you share your message, that you would give us ears to hear it and minds to conceive it and hearts to receive it. So the Lord, as we leave here this day, that we would not just be hearers of your word, but we would also be doers of your word. We pray all this in your great and mighty name and all God's people said, Amen. Friends, Christianity at the heart and core, Christianity in its very essence is a relationship with God through Jesus Christ who loves us and who wants the very, very best for us. That's what it is. On a personal note, when God finally broke into my life and He revealed the reality of His love for me, like many, many others, I felt overwhelmed. I felt absolutely overwhelmed with His extravagant and His unconditional love for me. I felt washed cleaned. I felt free because I was forgiven. I was forgiven. And I knew it in the core of my being. And he brought into me the most amazing, awesome, incredible, and fulfilling relationship one on one with him that I've ever experienced. In fact, literally, what happened on that day started a whole new life for me. Everything changed. The Apostle Paul puts it like this in 2 Corinthians 5.17. He says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. Friends, that happened to me. Just like it's happened to many of you in this room. And just like it's happened to many, 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 many others throughout the world. Throughout the years, I've collected a number of life stories, if you would, or testimonies from people within this church as well as from other churches who have experienced this new life that Paul is talking about. And I want to share some of those with you right now. One person wrote, I was sick of my life as it was. And so sitting in a chair in a truck stop, I bowed my head into another chair at midnight and I asked God to change my life. Within the hour, I was a new creation. God lifted me and he freed my heart and I knew I was a different person and it brought about dramatic changes. Another person right, writes, in all honesty, there was not a single instant that it happened to me. But it was a series of steps. Instead of a light switch that was either on or off, I experienced, they say, a dimmer switch that slowly turned on. Anybody have that kind of experience? Still another person writes, when I came to know Jesus Christ personally, I had been through lots of Sunday school lessons, a good number of worship services, a period of atheism, and finally, I knew God loved me. And they underlined me when they wrote this. And I also loved Him. Never had anyone been so real he became my purpose for living. In fact, He became my life. One last one. This person writes, I now have hope where previously there was only despair. I can forgive now where before there was only coldness. God is so alive for me, I can feel Him guiding me. And the complete and utter loneliness that I had been feeling is gone. God is filling a deep, deep void. Friends, as these testimonies illustrate, experiences can vary greatly, right? And they do. For some, there are life-changing, immediate differences right now, aren't there? But for others, it's a long, slow change. A gradual awareness, a dimmer switch that slowly turns on. But hear this, friends, the bottom line is this. It's not your experience or my experience that matters. It's not. 
What really matters is the fact that you and I have received Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, however that happens to us. And with that, you and I become God's children. That's what matters. The Apostle John puts it like this in John 1.12. He says, yet to all who receive him, speaking of Jesus, to all who receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Now friends, one thing that every good parent wants for their child to possess is a confidence, right? An utter security of their love and their relationship and their family, right? Deb and I try to do this daily with our kids and with our grandkids through hugs and through kisses and through words of affirmation and words of encouragement and I love yous. But to be honest, every once in a while, I intentionally try to do something a little different to try to shake them up and to hit my kids or grandkids from a little different perspective, a little different angle. And one of the things I used to do with my girls when they were little is that I'd grab one of them and I'd pull them to the side and I'd look them tenderly in the eye. And they say, honey, you know I love you, right? But I want you to know something. If God were to line up all the little girls in the world, if he were to line up all the little girls in the world, and he said you could pick whatever little girl you want, I would pick you. I would pick you. Honey, I love you so much. I am so thankful God gave you to me. Friends, every time I did that, that her little eyes would well up with tears, their little hearts would swell up with love, and their little faces would be transformed by joy. Why? Because they were assured. They were assured once again of their place in my heart and their place in our family. In the very same way, hear this, in the very same way, God wants all of us, all of us who have faith in and become His children. He wants all of us to be enveloped in His love and be assured of our place in His love and in His family. That's why the Apostle John says in 1 John 5, 30, 13, he says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. Why does he write these things? He says, so that you may know, that you may know you have eternal life. Friends, I love that little phrase, that you may know. That you may know why, because it means you and I don't have to guess. It means you and I don't have to have doubts. You and I don't have to have hopes. You and I don't have to have wishes. It means we can know. We can know we have eternal life and that we're a part of God's family. So the question becomes, how? How? How can you and I really know that? How can we be sure of our faith? Well, just as there are three legs that support that camera tripod over there, there are just as there are three legs, our assurance of our relationship with God firmly stands on the three members of the Trinity. First, there's the promises that the Father gives us through His Word, the Word of God. Second, there's the sacrifice of God's Son for us on the cross, the work of Jesus. And third, there's the assurance of the Holy Spirit's work in our hearts, the witness of the Spirit. So this morning, I want to look at each of these three things, one at a time. First, the Word of God. The Word of God. Friends, think about this. If you and I lived our lives relying on our feelings, then we'd never be sure about anything, would we? Never. I mean, depending on the weather and the breakfast we had or the breakfast we didn't have or whether she loves me or whether she loves me not, our feelings can go up and down and all around. They can be positive and negative. They're constantly changing. They're constantly shifting. They're deceptive. But on the other hand, the Bible, God's promises to us never change. They are always trustworthy and they are always reliable. Why? Because that is the very nature of the God who gives us His Word. He is trustworthy and He is reliable. And one promise that our trustworthy and reliable God gives us is Revelation 3.20. In this verse, John the Apostle is caught up in a vision. And in that vision, he sees Jesus speaking to seven different churches. And one of the churches he's speaking to is the church of Laodicea. 
And Jesus says to that church, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. He's talking about the most intimate kind of fellowship taking place. Friends, this verse is a very picturesque way of describing the reality of how we become Christians. A number of years ago, the artist Holman Hunt was inspired by Revelation chapter 320 to paint a picture entitled, The Light of the World. And Jesus, the light of the world, stands at a door, a door that's been closed for so long that it's overgrown with ivy and with, we with weeds. And that door, in that picture, that painting, represents the door to your heart and mine. And Jesus is standing at that door of our heart, and he's knocking, waiting for a response. After reviewing uh, this painting, someone approached Holman Hunt, and they said, Hey, Holman, you forgot to paint a handle on the door. And Holman said, No, I didn't. It's not a mistake. There's only one handle, and it's on the inside. It's on the inside. In other words, friends, if the door of our heart, yours and mine, is ever going to be open to Jesus, then by faith, we have to open it. We have to open it. And once we do, Jesus promises to come in and to eat with us and we with him. He also promises to never leave us nor forsake us. And he also promises to be with us always, even to the end of the age. And along with those promises to believers, hear this, he also gives the promise of eternal life. And friends, eternal life is a fullness of life that actually begins now. At the very moment we open our hearts to Christ, we begin to experience eternal life in that moment. But it doesn't end there. No, it goes on and on and on and on, even as we step through the death, the door we call death, and on into eternity. But you say, well, Derek, how do we know? I mean, absolutely. Where do we get the guarantee that, that Jesus has the power to keep those kind of promises? Without going into great detail today, we'll do it at Easter time, but Jesus' resurrection is our guarantee. His resurrection is our guarantee, it's our proof, hear this, that he has conquered death, and because of that, you and I can be assured that life doesn't have to end at the grave. And that history is not some meaningless or cyclical thing, but it's actually being guided by God's hand towards an incredible climax, the day of Christ's return. And friends, on that day, those that are in Christ will go to be with him forever. On that day, there'll be no more crying because there'll be no more heartbreak. On that day, there'll be no temptation because there will be no more sin. On that day, there will be no more suffering because there will be no more pain. On that day, you and I will see Jesus face to face. And for those of us that love him on that day, you and I will be given a glorious, painless, resurrected body. And on that day... You and I will be transformed into the moral likeness of Jesus and heaven will be our home. And on that day, 1 Corinthians 2.9 says that you and I will experience what no eye has seen, nor ear has heard, nor mind has conceived, but what God has prepared for those that love him. That's what we're going to experience on that day. C.S. Lewis has a fascinating insight about heaven that he actually writes into one of his classic children's books. He writes this. He says the term is over. Using the metaphor of school, the term is over and the holidays have begun. The dream has ended. This is the morning all life in this world has only been the cover of the title page. Think about this. All of life in this world has only been the cover of the title page. Now at last begins chapter one of the great story which no one on earth has ever read which goes on forever and ever, and in which every chapter, hear this, every chapter is better than the one before. No eye has seen, nor ear has heard, nor mind has conceived what God has prepared for those that love Him. Friends, God designed His Word to assure us of our relationship with Him. Number two, we can be assured through the work of Christ that He's done on the cross for you and me. Through the work Christ has done on the cross for you and me, we can be assured. Now, how does it strike you? How does it strike you when you hear somebody say something like, you know, I know that I know I'm going to go to heaven. I know that I know that. Or heaven, here I come. Here I come. How does it strike you when you hear something like that? 
To be honest, growing up, I used to think that those kind of people and those kind of statements were arrogant and they were pompous. I did. Hear me. And they would be. Those statements would be arrogant and pompous, pompous if, if, your entry and mine into heaven was based on our good deeds, our good life, our good works, and our kind things. But friends, the truth is, it's not. Why? Because all of our lives, all of our lives have been tainted by our sin. God says in Isaiah 64, 6, all our righteous acts, all our good deeds, all our good works are just filthy rags. They're just filthy rags. Friends, think about this. If you actually take a filthy rag and you wash your counter with it, what happens? That counter becomes contaminated, doesn't it? It contaminates the whole counter you're actually trying to clean. In the Hebrew, the words here for filthy rags are actually the words minstrel rags. And they're not just minstrel rags, but they're actually used minstrel rags. That's what the Hebrew is. Now, why would God use this very uncomfortable image? God uses this very uncomfortable image because He wants to communicate a very uncomfortable point. And the point is this. You and I may be very, very proud of all the good things we've done. You and I may be very, very proud of all the people that we've served and all the kind things that we've done for others. But hear this. The truth is the God of the universe, the exalted one, the high and holy one, says that your good deeds and mine, your good works and mine, your kind acts and mine are nothing but dirty, filthy rags that defile everything they touch. And so please hear this. Please hear this. No matter how good you and I think our good deeds are, no matter how many good and kind deeds you and I have done, we will never, 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 never be able to do anything to work our way into heaven. Never. And so friends, hear this. If it depends upon you and me to get into heaven, bottom line, you and I are doomed. We're doomed. Because at best, all we've got to give God is a bunch of filthy rags. And so hear this, thank God. Thank God that your eternity and mine is not dependent on us and what we've done. No, it depends on Christ and what Christ has done. Friends, you see that when Jesus went to the cross, He went there as the perfect Son of God to pay the price for your sins and mine. And as a result of paying that price, He now offers to you and me as a free gift, eternal life. Now let me ask you, what do you do, what do you have to do to make a free gift yours? What do you have to do? Well, you, you know, you, you can't work for it, right? You can't, you can't try to earn it. Why? It's a free gift. And, and so if you have to work for it, if you have to earn it, it's not a free gift. But hear this. Even with a free gift, you still have to do something. If you want it to be yours, right? You still have to do something. And what, that something, what is that something you have to do? You have to accept it. You have to receive it for yourself. You have to answer the door when Christ is knocking. Friends, if you and I want to have eternal life, then we have to accept God's free gift for ourselves. And that happens through faith. Through faith. Ephesians 2.8 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. Through faith you have been saved. And this is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. You say, well, Derek, what's faith then? If it's so important, if I can only be saved through faith, then what is faith? Well, friends, the truth is faith is a hard thing to define. It is. For example, John Patterson was a missionary in the South Pacific Islands. And when he got there, the tribal people that he met on those islands were cannibals. They'd never heard about Jesus, and his life was constantly in danger. While he was there, he decided that one of the best ways to reach these people was to put the gospel into their own language. By the way, friends, that's always the best way to reach people, to put the gospel in the language of the people. That's why God sent Jesus, one his only son, in bodily form to put the gospel in the language of the people. That's why he wants us to live like Jesus and love like Jesus and share his message wherever we go, because he wants us to put the gospel in the language of the people. That's why missionaries hear this and churches all over the world take the gospel and they wrap it in music of the people, the language of the people. And so Patterson began to translate the gospel of John into the language of the people. 
But before long, he ran into a problem. And the problem was there was no word, absolutely no word in that tribal language for belief or trust. Why? Because nobody trusted anybody. They had no word for belief or trust. And so as you can imagine, Patterson became very frustrated. But one day he was sitting in his chair as his housekeeper came into the house and into his room. And that housekeeper happened to be a native. And suddenly an idea popped into his mind. And so he lifted his feet off the ground as he's sitting in his chair. And he leaned back in his chair without any support. And he looked at his housekeeper and he said, what do you call this? What do you call what I'm doing right now? And that housekeeper looked at him and he used the word that means to lean your whole weight upon something. To lean your whole weight upon something. And friends, when Patterson heard that, he knew his problem was solved because faith is leaning your whole weight upon something. And that something is Jesus Christ and what He's done on the cross for you and me. Friends, this truth, this truth is actually found throughout the Bible. In the New Testament, Jesus speaks of it in John 3.16. He says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. Friends, the truth is because of our sin, hear this, you and I deserve to perish. You and I deserve to be eternally separated from God. But God, out of His extravagant love for you and me, when He saw the mess that sin had made in our lives, He gave His one and only Son, Jesus, to pay the price for us, to die upon the cross for our sins. And as a result of His sacrificial death, if you and I have faith, if we believe, if we lean our whole weight into Christ and what He did for you and me on the cross, then the gift of eternal life is ours. That truth is also found in the Old Testament. In Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6, the prophet Isaiah, hear this, hundreds of years before Jesus ever died upon a cross. Isaiah was directed by God to write this. For we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid upon him, Jesus, the iniquity of us all. Now what's he saying? He's basically saying that nobody's perfect. There's nobody's sinless. We've all messed up. We've all gone astray. And then in Isaiah 59 too, it talks about our sins, the things we do wrong, causing a separation between us and God, creating a barrier, if you would. And that barrier actually prevents us from experiencing God's love. And because of that barrier, Jesus Christ, the perfect sinless Son of God, went to the cross. And the Bible says that it was there upon that cross that God laid upon Jesus the iniquities, the wrongs, and the sins of your life and mine. Why? So that you, if you and I would have faith in Christ, if you and I would lean our whole weight into Him and His work on the cross, then that sin barrier between us and God could be removed. And so today, if you have faith in Jesus Christ and what He did for you on the cross, you can be assured of this. You can be assured of God's forgiveness. You can be assured that your guilt is going to be taken away. You can be assured that you will never be condemned. Romans 8.1 puts it like this. There is no condemnation. None, it says. For those that are in Christ Jesus. None. Why? Because He has taken that on. Friends, Christ's work on the cross is the second reason you and I can be assured that we have eternal life. And there's a third reason. The third reason is the witness of the Spirit. The witness of the Spirit. Friends, when somebody becomes a Christian, at that very moment, God places in them His Holy Spirit to live within them. The Bible calls that the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in your life and mine. The Holy Spirit comes in to indwell us, those that believe. And when the Holy Spirit comes to indwell us, there are many, many works and many, many activities that He wants to get done. But there are two of them in particular that are ones that He wants to use to reassure us of our faith. First, He wants to transform us from within. He wants to transform us from within. Why? Hear this. Because according to the Romans, the Holy Spirit's number one desire in your life and mine, the Holy Spirit's number one goal in your life and mine is to conform us to reshape us into the image of Christ. In other words, to develop Christ-like character in you and me. Why? 
so that no matter where we go, no matter what we do, we experience and others experience through us the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. In other words, he wants to bring forth from us the character qualities of Christ. That's what the fruit of the Spirit is. The character qualities of Christ. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Why? So that people can see and experience Jesus in us. And so from the moment that you and I open our hearts to Christ, the Holy Spirit begins to work in our lives to produce his fruit. And because of that, If you and I have truly given our lives to Jesus Christ, if we truly have, then there ought to be changes in our character. And those changes in our character ought to be observable. And they ought to be so observable that other people can be noticing them. I mean, they ought to be able to see in you and me that we're living more and more like Jesus. They ought to be able to see in you and me that we're loving more like Jesus. They ought to be able to see in you and me that we're sharing his message more and more. Now, obviously, most of those changes aren't going to happen overnight, right? I mean, that's not going to happen that way. Why? Because it takes time to grow fruit, doesn't it? It takes time to grow fruit. I know, I, I know a guy who loves pears, and he loves them so much that he actually planted a pear tree in his backyard because he wanted to eat his fill of, of pears. And every day after he planted it, He just kind of wandered back into the backyard where his pears were hopefully growing. And, of course, there was nothing happening at first. But then one day he had talked about this with a a couple of our friends. And uh, when he wasn't around, another friend of ours decided to play a little joke on him. And you've probably heard of people doing something like this. But this friend took a bunch of Granny Smith apples. And remember, this is a pear tree. And so he took a bunch of Granny Smith apples and he tied them onto that pear tree. Now, when our other friend returned, of course, he wasn't fooled, but hear this, he was thankful for the reminders. One, it takes time to grow fruit, right? It takes time to grow fruit. And number two, when fruit does grow, it's consistent with the tree. In other words, pear trees naturally produce pears, not apples. Friends, over time, if you and I will cooperate with the Holy Spirit's work in our lives, then we're going to begin to bear the fruit that is consistent with His Spirit. In other words, you and I are going to become more and more loving. We're going to become more and more joyful and peaceful and patient and kind and good and faithful and gentle and self-controlled. And so if you and I allow the Holy Spirit to do our work in, or His work in our lives, We are going to see all kinds of changes in our character. But catch this. We'll also see changes in our relationships. Changes in our relationship both with God and with others. For example, we'll begin to develop a whole new love for God. A whole new love for God. For example, through the years I've met several people who have now become Christian. But when I first met them, they were repulsed. Absolutely repulsed by the name of Jesus. They hated it. And they hated it for all kinds of different reasons. And it created all kinds of negative emotions in them. But they hated it. But then they experienced the extravagant, unconditional love of Jesus Christ in their lives for themselves. And I promise you, they would tell you today that the name of Jesus today is the sweetest, most precious, most powerful, and most beautiful name they know. They love it. They serve it. And they give their lives to it. Why? Why? Because he who has been forgiven much, loves much. But friends, it's not only our attitude towards God that changes, but hear this, it's also our attitude towards others. Towards others. For example, when somebody becomes a new Christ follower, a new Christian, They often begin noticing faces, faces in the street and at work in their neighborhoods that they never noticed before. They never noticed those faces before. But now, now that they've experienced the extravagant, unconditional love of Jesus, they want to share it. And so when they see somebody who's hurting, they want to reach out and heal. When they see somebody in need, they want to reach out and help. When they see somebody who's seeking, they want to reach out and lead them to Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. Friends, when they truly experience the extravagant, unconditional love, they want to share it. There's also often 
major changes in their attitude towards other Christians. I mean, they actually begin to experience, think about this, when you first became a, a Christ follower, if you've been one for a while, think about the love you began to experience, the fellowship and the friendship at a depth you had never experienced before. Now hear this, the Holy Spirit is not only going to bring changes to our lives that others can observe, but He is also going to bring deep inner convictions that we are God's children. Romans 8 15 and 16 says, For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received a spirit of sonship. And by Him, not by our strength, but by Him, we cry, Abba, which is the Aramaic word for Daddy. By the Spirit, we cry, Daddy, Father. Listen to this. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. One person I know wrote this when I asked him to write their testimony. They said, at age 16, I was invited to attend a revival meeting. During the sermon, I felt a deep conviction and a call to go forward. And when I knelt down at the altar to confess my sins, God was faithful with His cleansing power. There is no doubt I became a new child in Christ that day, and I often say now, I know that I know. Friends, that's what Romans 8, 15, and 16 is talking about. It's talking about God's Spirit testifying to our spirit that we are His children. We can know that we know. But hear this, not everyone is going to experience that in the very same way. For example, Carl Tuttle is a pastor. He came from a broken home. He grew up with an abusive father. And in general, he had a very, very difficult and unhappy childhood. So as you can imagine, because of that, when he became a Christian, he struggled greatly with his intimacy with God. Struggled greatly. One day, he desperately wanted to hear from God and what God was saying to him. So he drove out into the countryside so he could spend all day in uninterrupted prayer with God. But after about 15 minutes, he felt like his prayers weren't going anywhere. And so depressed and disappointed, he packed it all in and he headed for home. When he got there, he greeted his wife and then he asked where Zachary, their little two-month-old boy, was at. And she told him and so he went in and he picked up Zachary. And when he did, Carl says, suddenly, suddenly I had this incredible feeling of love for my little boy. It just washed all over me. And he said, I started crying. And I said, Zachary, I love you. I love you with all my heart. And no matter what happens in this life, I will never harm you. I will always protect you. I will always be your father. I will always be your friend. I will always care for you. I will always nurture you. And I will always do this no matter what you do or what sins you commit or whether you turn from me or even from God. And then Carl says, suddenly I had this overwhelming sense, overwhelming sense that as I was holding my little boy, God was holding me. He was holding me. And God was saying to me, Carl, you're my son. I love you. And no matter what you do and no matter where you go, I will always love you. I will always care for you. I will always provide for you. And I will always guide you. Friends, the Spirit, hear this, the Spirit was witnessing the Carl Spirit that he was a child of God. Do you have that witness? Now hear this, your experience may not be anything like that, but do you have that witness in your heart? The witness of the Holy Spirit in your life. Friends, of the witness of the Spirit is the third way you and I can be assured of our relationship with God, that we've been forgiven, that we're a part of His family, and that we have eternal life. Objectively, objectively, that assurance comes through an ongoing change in our character and in our relationships, both with God and with others. Subjectively, it comes through a deep inner conviction that we are God's child. 
In these three ways, the Word of God, the work of Jesus, and the witness of the Spirit, we who have faith in Jesus Christ can be assured. We can be assured that we are God's children and that we have eternal life. And so hear this. To openly state to other people that you and I have eternal life is not being pompous and it's not being arrogant because hear this, it is not about us. It is not about us. It's about Him. It's about Him and what He has done for us. What He has done for us, that's what it's about. It's about what God has promised in His Word. It's about what Jesus has achieved for us on the cross. And it's about what the Holy Spirit has done and is doing in us. Friends, God loves each and every one of us. And when you and I become His child, like any loving parent, He wants us to have a confidence and utter assurance of His love and of our part in His family. Amen? Let's pray. God, thank you for the loving Heavenly Father that you truly are. And Lord, I know that uh, there are probably a number of people in this room right now who did not have loving earthly fathers. And it's hard for them. It's hard for them to imagine a God who really loves them and is tender and loves them unconditionally and passionately and extravagantly. And so, Lord, open their eyes and open their hearts that they might experience You in the fullness of who You are and not have to look through who their father in this world was to see You. Let them see You for who you are. And then in their very core, let them be embraced. Embraced by your love. Embraced by the assurance that as they have come to you in faith, that you have received that as a method to be able to come into your family. To become a part of your family and to spend all eternity with you. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for who you are. Thank you, God, for your great love. And all God's people said, Amen.